The Philadelphia Eagles lose to the Atlanta Falcons in a traumatizing manner that's sure to bring up memories of the Seattle Seahawks game from last year. Welcome to the Philly Film Room Podcast. I'm Nick Waters, and as we go through this review episode, I think it's important to keep in mind what we saw on Monday and think, is this a long-term issue or was it just a one-game sample size and are there minor adjustments that need fixing? After all, if you look at what happened around the rest of the league, the top NFC contenders went down as well in terms of the Lions, 49ers, and Cowboys. So are we as fans just making too big of a deal uh, of a loss on Monday night early in a new season? Well, that's something that we're going to be paying attention to. But I think we have to remember that as we went through all offseason, this is stuff that we kind of talked about, how the beginning of the season is likely to be a little rocky and to be a little rough especially when you have two new coordinators on both sides of the ball. Now, admittedly, the offensive side of the ball has been a little bit smoother of a transition, but you also have a blending of systems. So you have partly Kellen Moore system blending with partly a Nick Sirianni system. So the offense has a lot of returning pieces and they're running a lot of schemes that they have run in the past. So there's some familiarity there. And in the receiver preview episode, I mentioned how Nick Sirianni and Kellen Moore ran a lot of similar concepts. So I thought that the transition would be a little smoother on offense. But on defense, in particular on defense, I I really think we're going to have a bumpy road, definitely for the first half of the season, but we should see progression throughout the year. But when you have a new coordinator, a bunch of new faces on defense at every position, from the defensive line, linebackers, two safeties, and corners, And then you look at a lot of these new faces or a lot of these faces that are stepping up are young players and they're all learning a new system. And some players are playing positions that they haven't really played in the NFL before, namely Zach Bond. You can see, you can understand why they're having some struggles to transition in the NFL. So for that reason, I think we're going to have a a rocky road going forward. I don't think this is just going to get flipped overnight in terms of some of the issues that the defense is having. But the point is, We thought that there was going to be issues with this team to start the year in terms of some missteps and some mistakes. So we can't jump off the train at the first sign of adversity. This is when the coaches make their money. They don't make their money by developing a scheme and then running it out there. They develop the scheme, teach the players, and then correct the players on the issues they're they're having running the scheme. So this is where the coaches make their money, is correcting these issues that we're seeing. This is where we see, does Vic Fangio... Hold his worth. Does his assistant coaches hold their worth at the position groups, at his pass game coordinator, his run game coordinators, right? So this is where we should start to see whether or not this coaching staff is for real or not. But at the end of the day, both the offense and defense will be different by the end of the year. And what's important is will the offense and defense be cohesive enough on both sides of the ball to be competitive in the playoffs? Because this is what it's all about. A week two loss right now doesn't end your season. But if they don't grow from this, then it will end their season because there's some serious issues that they do need to correct and fix if they do want to be Super Bowl contenders. So can all this be explained away by a new scheme or are there long-term issues? So let's start with the defense first. The defense is currently one of the worst in the NFL. They're 30th in EPA per play. They're 28th in passing yards per play and 32nd in rushing yards allowed per attempt. And the pass rush is struggling as well, although if you look at their pressure numbers, they're not as bad as you would think. Right now, it's impossible to decipher whether the issues are with the scheme or with the talent because the scheme is not being run correctly right now. You can't look at what the players are doing on the field right now and look at what the Dolphins were doing last year with their starters and saying yeah, well, the, 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 the team's just getting out-schemed. They're not running the defense properly to say they're getting out-schemed. So I think there's some things that they can do to fix it and make life easier for certain people. But as we go through the season, part of a new coordinator is not just the, the players learning a new coach and a new system. It's the coach learning his personnel, what they're good at, what they're not good at, and figuring out what are the tools, what are the plays, what are our answer is going to be this year to mitigate our weaknesses and accentuate our strengths. So this is going to be a long-term process. So just because in week two we're having issues doesn't mean we're going to have these same issues in week 14, but we might. And so let's talk about some of this stuff. 
Vic Fangio's defense is complex, so it's a work in progress. You see a lot of slants, a lot of stunts. You see a lot of different blitzes and movements along the line that's causing issues on the back end for the linebackers, for the safeties, for the corners, and their run fits. And you're seeing that become an issue. There's, it's also a very complex defense in terms of the defensive line. How do you play the blocks in front of you? They're not a team that just gets off the ball right away and penetrates gaps. You have to read the offensive lineman in front of you, and based on their movement, you have to play the block a certain way. That takes time to, to get down, to get that process down, where you're just reacting quickly and not having to think about, oh, offensive lineman moved to the left, I need to react this way based on the pre-snap formation from the offense, based on the type of run plays that they like to run, based out of this form, uh, out of this formation. So... Just little things like that can really slow the defense down. And I think that's what's happening a lot right now. So I think they do, you know, going forward, they do need to simplify and then add to the defense as they grow. Take away some of the play calls, some of the stunts, really focus down and getting good at their base play calls, and then add stuff as we go. Because right now, they're not good at the base stuff. And they're not good when they're trying to throw in changeups. So when they're trying to slant their line or trying to use a stunt or, or a blitz, uh, they're, they're just not cohesive at the moment. And it's really, you can see it with their linebackers that they're not sure if they should be filling downhill on the run. You can see it with their safeties as they're filling from the top down. And you can see it with their corners in cracker place. Let's start with the pass rush and, and, and look at what the Falcons' plan was and what they were trying to accomplish. Because the pass rush has been struggling, right? They struggled against the Falcons and they struggled against the Packers. I think there's several reasons for it. I think part of the reason is for both of those teams, the scheme that they like to run. The Falcons came out in a very vanilla scheme in week one. That was not the case in week two, right? So I think part of the issue is a scheme that these teams like to run that does help mitigate pressure. But the Eagles' pressure rate in week two, Next Gen Stats had them with the 12th best pressure rate. So there's a lot of concern for the Eagles' pass rush right now. And I think to some degree, Rightfully so. I think some of it is a little bit of overreaction. But when you look at the numbers, they're not as bad as you would think when compared to the rest of the league. But we need to look at the Falcons' protection plan. So we need to look at their protection plan on obvious pass downs. So third and fourth down and two-minute and end-of-game situations. So situations where it's 95% chance they're going to pass the ball. How did the Falcons set up their base protection plan so that they could handle what the Eagles present from a pass rush standpoint. So there were 14 obvious pass down situations where the Falcons dropped back to pass and didn't use a screen or the Eagles weren't in an exotic front that would manipulate the Falcons pass protection, right? So the Falcons base protection plan. The Falcons had 14 of these plays on obvious pass downs. The offensive line slid away from Chris Lindstrom on 13 of the 14 plays. So what would happen is the offensive line would slide away from Carter and Huff's side and to Josh Sweat's side and whoever was a defensive tackle rotating on that side. What this would do is put Huff and Carter in one-on-one -on -one situations. And then on the other side, you have a three-on-two situation with the offensive line where the center and guard can work on the defensive tackle. Then the center can overtake the defensive tackle. The guard can slide to the left tackle and help out the left tackle with whoever's rushing against him. Then on the other side, you have the one-on-ones like I talked about. But when you look at how the, the Falcons set up their base protection plan, on 11 of these 14 plays that I'm discussing, Bryce Huff played a snap. On those plays, Huff was chipped by the Falcons eight times. Of those three other times when Huff wasn't chipped, two of those times came when the Eagles were using an overload front that changed the protection of the Falcons and force them out of a situation where they could ch chip on Huff. And then one other time did they not chip Huff. So really, Huff was only had three real opportunities to pass rush and obvious passing downs where he wasn't being chipped. So really what was happening is the line was sliding away from Carter and Huff. They were helping on Huff, and then they were giving Jalen Carter the one-on-one -on -one opportunity. And then they were giving Jalen Carter the vast majority of one-on-one -on -one matchups with Lindstrom, and Lindstrom won the majority of the times. I'm gonna get back to Huff here in a minute, but we gotta talk about the, the Lindstrom versus Carter matchup because we talked about Lindstrom and the pregame show, how he was an all-pro player, how this was the matchup to watch between Carter and between Lindstrom, and the Falcons said, we're gonna help everywhere else, and it's gonna be our best guy against your best guy, and their best guy just won consistently. 
Jalen Carter had a couple of reps where he beat Lindstrom, and Milton Williams had a rep where he beat Lindstrom for a sack. But for the vast majority of reps, Lindstrom was handling Jalen Carter pretty easily. And I thought the biggest issue came down to Jalen Carter's hand usage. His hands were just too wide. And Chris Lindstrom, we talked about, was jump setting him. So he's getting out of his stance quickly, not getting depth. He would just get out of his stance quickly and attack Jalen Carter and get his hands on him right away. But he used inside hand placement, quick inside hand placement. And when Carter's using looping strikes, he's too slow. He's letting Lindstrom get his hands in his chest and he's getting corralled. And it looks like Lindstrom's going for a ride on, an, on a mechanical bull on a Saturday night, right? But Lindstrom was able to, to hang on and show why he was a uh, all-pro player, right? Now, getting back to Huff, looking at the way that the, that the Falcons chipped Huff, they chipped Huff on a variety of different ways. So they chipped him with tight ends and running backs. With tight ends, they chipped him where the tight end was aligned inside of Huff, so he had to work inside out. And then they chipped Huff where the tight end was outside of Huff, so he's chipping him from outside in and giving him different looks. One particular play where Huff was pretty much chipped in the back and pushed into the offensive lineman. And when you're a speed rusher that's whose rush is based so much off of timing, off of steps and footwork, and you get pushed and your timing's off from behind, it's going to be an issue. And then with running backs, they were using the running back out of the back, backfield to chip Huff from the outside. We talked about how Huff could probably get outside of McGarry. He has the speed, he has the quickness, he has the, uh, the, the advantage, the height difference really played into Huff's advantage to get outside of McGarry and, and win around the edge. The Falcons made sure that wasn't going to happen by chipping with the tight end, but then chipping also with the running back and running the running back out of the backfield in a way that prevented Huff from getting around to the outside. But the Eagles, or excuse me, the Falcons didn't chip to this degree when Brandon Graham was in the game. And they did this one time when Nolan Smith was in the game on an obvious pass down. Right. So it was clear. And and even and, and there was even a play where Huff switched sides of the field because he usually rushes against right tackles. There was a, a series where they switched Sweat and Huff. Huff started running against the left tackle. The very first time it happened, you can see Kirk Cousins point to Bijan Robinson and say, you need to block over here. They had a clear game plan to not let Huff beat them. Right. So the Falcons were showing Huff respect, even though Eagles fans don't think he's very good and think he think he can't play. Right. For, for whatever reason. Um, when you look at Huff, he's struggling right now. And we talked about it in the last week's episode. Right. Hassan Reddick struggled in his first few games with the Eagles. He had two pressures in his first two in his first two games with the Eagles. Hassan uh, Bryce Huff has two pressures in his first two games with the Eagles. And he, like we saw with the Packers game, he was getting chipped a lot in that game. And then in this game, he got chipped on eight of his 11 obvious pass rush situations. So both these guys are earning respect from opposite teams in regards to their pass rush. Now, I know there's that clip going around of Huff struggling on the tight end and not getting a pass rush. I will say a number of things about that. Number one, wait till you see how the New Orleans Saints shut down Micah Parsons, blocking him primarily with tight ends. You can block. Edge rushers with tight ends. I know that we, you know, for when, when, when we beat the 49ers and the conference championship several years ago, people were clowning on Shanahan saying, why would you block, why would you block Reddick with a tight end? If instead of just sitting there trying to shit on 49ers fans the entire time, you kind of look around the league and see that even Andy Reid, even Name name a coordinator that you think is one of the best coordinators in the league. I guarantee you he's had his tight ends blocking on defensive ends. Now you say, well, Hassan Reddick would have destroyed the tight end. I can show you several plays of Hassan Reddick getting stuck on tight ends as well. The thing about this play is this is why these systems are so good at protecting their quarterbacks. They force your defensive line to play run first. And then when your offensive line has already and your tight ends who are blocking have already gotten into a good position, then the defensive line has to transition from run to pass, and you're not in an advantageous situation. You don't spend all offseason practicing how to rush against a, 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 um, a look where it was a run look first, and then you have to transition to pass rush. The vast majority of your, your practice reps where you're practicing your moves are going to be against offensive linemen or against dummies where you're you're simulating that they're taking a pass set, not a play action pass. 
right? So you get these defensive linemen running and flowing and playing run first and then have to transition a pass. This is why these systems are so good at protecting their quarterbacks. And we're going to see it again next week with the Saints. Then you add into that Fangio's defense. I don't know if Huff is necessarily a great fit for Fangio's defense because Fangio's defense, while they like hybrid players, I think their edge rushers are best suited to be power rushers or bigger, stronger rushers that have enough mobility to drop into coverage. And the reason being, Fangio asks his edge rushers to play the run first before dropping, before uh, transitioning to pass rush, especially on early downs. And this is why you see on first down, the Eagles' average get off time is 27th in the league. On third down, it's 14th. Huff's a player that his fastball is his speed, his get off. He has one of the best get offs in the league. He's built for these systems, these Sala, Robert Sala systems, these uh, D'Amico Ryan systems, these what the 49ers do, where they're just gap penetrators, where they get upfield as quick as they can. If you're playing a system where they're asking you, especially on early downs, to play run first, that's not going to be Huff's system. So I, I really do feel like he's going to turn into a rotational edge rusher. And as we transition to the run game, to the run defense, uh, start to talk about that and start to about, talk about Huff as well. At the end of the day, there are better run defenders on this team. So I think Huff is probably going to be in a role where he is going to play a lot more on passing situations and early downs. That's what's best for the team. I, I am seeing some stuff on the internet talking about how he's unplayable. Uh, a lot of that's just people that don't understand run fits, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But my last point about the pass rush is knowing that the, the Falcons were so obvious and so adamant about how they wanted to protect and slide their, and slide their line, that gave Fangio a, a, a golden opportunity to develop pressures, to set up his stunts, to take advantage of that slide. You want to, to, to pressure the man side of the protection. So you want to pressure and attack the opposite side of the slide, the two-man side of the protection and most protection schemes. And if the offense is signaling to you, saying, we are sliding away from Lindstrom on the vast majority of obvious passing downs, send some pressures to that side. Use some stunts. We didn't see Fangio send Huff on a stunt until late into the fourth quarter. And then he used an exotic front, where, which signaled, hey, we're going to stunt, and then the offensive line slid their line to Huff. And then on the next drive, they finally used a tech stunt, I think it was, yeah, it was a tech stunt, where the defensive tackle penetrated and then Huff looped around. And that forced Matt Ryan, or excuse me, Kirk, Rosen, Kirk Cousins to drift in the pocket. Now, the coverage was bad on the back end, so uh, they gave up a, a pass anyways. But you force him to move off his spot, and that's what you want with your pressures and with your stunts, right? So to me, my biggest issue with Fangio in the game, and this game in particular, was the fact that he didn't devise ways to generate pressure for his team, knowing that your best pass rusher was losing his battle the majority of the times against their team's best pass blocker. They were sliding to help on the opposite side, and then they were chipping your edge rusher. So you're only getting one true one-on-one -on -one opportunity, and he didn't create any ways to take advantage of what the Falcons were doing and force them into a different protection plan. So for me, that what I think was the biggest issue in terms of what I didn't like out of the Fangio defense. Now switching to the run defense, I'm going to go deeper on this in a film episode because I think we need to break this down in detail and I can't really explain it in a podcast form. So I'm going to talk a little bit in generalities, um, but the issues in this run game can be narrowed down to three main factors in my eyes, at least against the Falcons. And then the combination of Jalen Carter, Milton Williams, and Moro Ojomo struggled against the Falcons' outside zone scheme. And in particular, Milton Williams and Ojomo as the two eye defenders. If the, the Eagles are going to run their, their even front, their over front with their four down linemen, I'm starting to think we might need to switch who are the primary defenders, the primary interior defensive linemen on, in those fronts to maybe. Listen, let's see if we can fix the issues first, but I think you might have to go to a combination of where Jordan Davis is playing more in that two-eye position or maybe even Thomas Booker, so we'll have to see. I'll add into that. The, the second part is the linebackers really struggle to play off of the defensive tackles in front of them. Part of playing linebackers, linebacker is you have to flow and morph and 
make your defensive lineman right in front of them. I've talked about this a little bit, especially in the preseason. I don't think the Eagles did a very good job of that on Monday night. And in particular, I think both Dean and Bond didn't do a good job of that. But I thought Zach Bond had a very, very bad day. For as good of a day as he had in his first game, I think he had an equally worse game in the second game. And it's a, I'll just preface this and say if he has a couple more games this bad, it's going to be hard seeing how he can stay in the starting lineup. And these are things that we talked about how we saw some glimpses of some issues last week. And they continued on to this week. Right? So... Zach Bond was getting cut a million times. I think there was things that the defensive line in front of him, namely Jordan Car- Jalen Carter, could have done to protect him better. But Zach Bond was getting cut by Chris Lindstrom a lot. And if that continues, I guarantee you they're going to be working on cut blocks this week. And if Zach, if that continues, I don't. It's going to be hard to see how Zach Bond can stay on the field. I also thought he was he- hesitant shooting open gaps several times when gaps did present themselves. And I think part of this goes into back to this defense is a little too complex, especially for a guy that hasn't played a whole lot of linebacker in the NFL. If, if we can cut back, cut, cut back on some of the exotic natures of the things that Fangio wants to do as a coordinator, because a lot of things he wants to do, a lot of the answers that he gives are answers that will really help a defense. But if the defense can't run what he's asking to run right now, he's going to have to scale back some of that stuff. And I think Bond is having an issue being aggressive and penetrating downhill when the opportunity presents itself. So that happened a few times. Really just not trusting his eyes overall is how you can really boil it down. I thought Dean wasn't great on several instances either. We'll touch on more of this stuff in the episode. Be patient with me. It's a short week, so I'm ha- I have to get out the, the preview episode next. So look for that episode this week, and hopefully I can get it out Saturday. Third thing that I thought was a major factor in the run defense issues against the Falcons was the corners and safeties did a bad job in run fits when the Eagles did try spilling the ball. So what I mean by that is just overall, CJ, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson has had issues in both games in run fits, knowing where he's supposed to be fitting, right? Um, I'll just leave it at that. Run fits have been an issue for CJ. The corners... The Eagles are really trying to to stop the Falcons' run game in a number of different ways. One of the ways they try to stop it is by spilling the ball, meaning you're plugging up all the interior gaps with your defensive linemen and forcing the run to bounce to the outside to unblock defenders, which are often either your safeties or your corners. The Eagles had issues with their corners and, and crack replace. So when the receivers would come close to the line of scrimmage, they would crack down and block and try to seal the safety that was responsible for a uh, the outside gap, then the corner has to crack replace. He has to replace that safety's run responsibility. Both Quinion Mitchell and Darius Slay were just late in their crack replace responsibilities against the Falcons. Like I said, part of being and figuring out a new coordinator is the players learning the, the, the system and the coach, but it's also the coach learning his personnel and what they're good at. He's likely going to find out that trying to spill the ball and relying on your corners to step up in the run game on this team probably isn't the best bet. So in the future, I'd imagine the Eagles are going to try and use their edge rushers to force the run back inside and cut the ball off instead of forcing it to spill outside. Cut the ball off and force it to cut back to the inside defenders pursuing. So we'll, we'll see how that transitions going forward. Overall, I thought there was a lot of reviews going around on Twitter uh, blaming the wrong people. Namely, again, we'll we'll talk about Bryce Huff. A lot of stuff about Bryce Huff. People were kind of picking on some of his issues. I will say this. I don't think Bryce Huff's a good run defender. But I think some of the stuff going around about the run fits in general and about the fronts that the team should be using are just kind of misplaced. Uh, We're kind of, we do this every year where we pick who we want to pick on. Like right now, People are still picking on Jordan Davis when it was Carter, Milton Williams, and Ojomo who had by far a worse day. Jordan Davis isn't even on the list of my issues with the run game, and yet people continue to blame him when the issues really lie with other people. Now, in terms of the, there's a lot of conversation going around, should the Eagles change their fronts, moving to more of a five-down front? And I will say this, maybe, maybe that's what they should do. This team might be better running their five-down fronts, just based on their personnel, right? But I'm not saying that is exactly the answer. The Eagles gave up two 30-yard gains on the ground 
and their odd down fronts last week against the Packers. So that's not just going to fix all of your issues. There's still deeper issues in my eyes than are you in an even front or are you in an odd front? My bigger issue is this is what happens whenever teams lose, and especially when people don't really know what the solution is or how to fix some of the solutions. What they say is, well, just change, make broad sweeping changes, and instead of using your four down front, eliminate that. You can only use these fronts. Why don't we try and fix the issues with what we're having with our four down fronts instead of just saying, well, that's out the door in week two? Especially because once you say, I'm only using these fronts or I go to start to lean in very heavily into a certain front, every front has its pros and its cons. It has its weaknesses and it has its strengths. Just because we switched a different front doesn't mean we're going to be better at stopping the run. And like I said, against the Packers, they still gave up explosive runs. The issue is not the front. The, the issue is how they're playing the front. Now, they might be better playing the front with their personnel out of different fronts, but I, I think you need to try to correct the issues they're having before just saying, we got to get rid of this. I've seen Milton Williams. I've seen Moro Joma. I've seen Jalen Carter make good plays playing in the four down front, but they might be better playing down out of their five down odd front. So that's something to monitor. But I think you got to fix the execution issues first. Uh, lastly, simplify the stunts. Until the Eagles are more comfortable with the linebackers filling the gaps. But again, they weren't good in their base calls either. So it's just a lot of issues they got to fix at the moment. Looking at their coverage, play action got linebackers to bite up and create voids behind them on several instances. I thought Zach Bond was really late to react and get depth once he recognized that it was no longer a run and was going to be a pass. He just continued to bite on the run fake long after he should have recognized and started to get depth again. Serious issue. If he doesn't start to correct some of that stuff, again, it's new system, new positions, but and we need to give these guys time to grow. But I am gonna. This is something I am gonna be uh, watching because Bond was lost in coverage all day. It wasn't just play action. There's a number number of other times where he was just late to react to people crossing his face, to running backs in the flat. It was a very tough day for Bond overall. Uh, I thought Quinion got attacked. At the end of the game, uh, he gave up 53 of the 70 yards. And this is part of what happens with the rookie. He had the really nice pass breakup early in the game that, honestly, it was a tough It was a tough play. The receiver made a play on the ball and ripped it out as well. So I'm not going to say it should have been an interception. It was a great play overall. But when it came down to it, he was targeted three times on the last drive, gave up three catches for 53 yards. This is what happens when you got rookies on the field. This is why rookies often don't play early, especially when you look at one of the plays. He just bit and took the cheese. He is a flat defender and then in a game scenario, and he jumps a flat route way too quick where he needs to sink underneath a corner route and then come up and play the flat route late, rally to the ball late. The Falcons, time is their enemy. You can't let them just have free yards like that, right? So, and you saw Avante Maddox yelling at him during the game. These are things he'll... Week two, or excuse me, week three, Quinion Mitchell, I bet doesn't make that play. I bet more experienced Quinion Mitchell makes that play. But this is what happens with rookies. You go through the learning curve. You go through the bumps and bruises. But when you look at how the defense gave up all those plays, all, all those yards very quickly, a lot of it came on the young rookie. But he'll bounce back. He'll have good days ahead of him. I'll add into this as well. There was just a lot of miscommunications, blown coverages, and bad execution of assignments. So I think we need to discuss differences between blown coverage and bad execution. To me, a blown coverage is when a flat defender, there should be a flat defender and nobody plays a flat. To me, that's a blown coverage. What Quinion did, I think, is bad execution of the coverage that was being asked. So I thought we saw both of those against the Falcons. We continue to see blown coverages where guys weren't playing there's certain zones or covering guys they're supposed to cover. But then I thought we also saw bad execution. So there's a lot to work on with this defense. And honestly, I don't know if this defense is... We need to get this defense to an average defense by the end of the year. And they will have better days ahead of them. They're not going to continue giving up six yards per rush. But we got to get this defense to an average defense if they're going to compete in the playoffs. If this offense can turn into one of the top offenses in the NFL, you don't have to have a top defense to win. But you can't have a bottom defense and win in the NFL. But as we transition to the offense now, 
I thought the offense was a mixed bag overall, but it definitely was a better day than the defense. And I thought they moved the ball well for the most part, but they did sputter throughout the day. And ultimately, it led to them not putting up as many points on the board as they should have. And again, this offense is still a work in progress, learning the new scheme or the new blended scheme. So I think we should start to see some progress for this or some of the issues that we're seeing and we'll talk about. Some of that stuff will get better as the year goes on and as the team gets more comfortable with the scheme and what's being asked of them. But again, this was an experience. We talked about this. This was an experienced Atlanta defense that doesn't give up a ton of big plays. They make you work down the field for their yards. And that's exactly why both Eric and I had the under in this game. We had this as a low scoring game was because of the fact that they make you dink and dunk. Don't give up explosive plays. And the Eagles really didn't hit a bunch of explosive plays in this game. But I did like the run game. The run game looked really good overall. From Saquon running the ball to what I think is really the strength of this team overall is this offensive line. They can absolutely move people on the ground. And the people that I had concerns about coming into the year on the offensive line, Cam Jurgens and Mekhi Becton, a lot of those concerns are being alleviated. Jurgens, in particular is much better at center than he was at guard. And I think that's to be expected. He had no experience at guard and you could see a lot of that stuff play out. He's much better at center and the run and pass game. Becton opens up massive running lanes on the ground. I posted something on Twitter, just a little clip of him over and over and over and over again, torquing guys out of gaps by himself and creating huge holes for Saquon Barkley to run. Saquon Barkley can be a league leader in rushing yards if they continue to give him the ball like they're giving him and if he continues to get lanes like this. This is really fun to watch. And really... I wouldn't be surprised if they're working on giving Becton a contract. I'm sure contract talk, talks have started with Becton at this point in time. I will say he did give up a sack on a stunt. A little bit of that probably could have been a little bit better pocket movement. Jalen probably couldn't have probably could have navigated that a little bit better. Um, but again, this is a work in progress. What you like to see is the flashes. He is absolutely dominant on the ground so far in the first two weeks. So I you can really get behind this guy and run. And if you truly have to help this guy out in pass protection, you can not help him out because you have good pieces around him. I really like their scheme, their run scheme, and what they did to attack the Falcons' run fits. And I, I, I do want to keep to bring this into a video to its own episode to kind of show you guys what they were doing to make life easier for everyone. But this was really a blend of the Sirianni and Stoutland run game with Kellen Moore principles. So you saw a lot of run plays that the Eagles ran last year, but they would just attach like an orbit motion to it. And it really, what it would do is it would manipulate defenders and force them to have to, uh, you could force who was in the run fits by using this motion and based on how Atlanta wanted to match with the motion. So they were able to manipulate who was in the fit and who was out of the fit using this motion. And then it, they also did a good job of using motion and formations and alignments to force safeties to fit into A-gaps. So I thought they did, did a good job with the scheme overall. And I really love their end-of-game run scheme with Jalen Hurts. They really applied all the same principles that they ran earlier in the game with Saquon Barkley. And then they just used it with Jalen as... The runner but what they also did is then they also used saquon barkley as the guy running this the the orbit motion and then you saw this play out where it essentially turns into somewhat of an option play where you, jalen has an option to run the ball up the middle or he can throw the swing screen to, to saquon barkley and we saw this play out on a third down where saquon barkley had a power through for an extra couple yards to pick up a first down so great scheme there overall i truly think this team if you want to see this team really compete, and especially through the playoffs, I think they need to become a smash-mouth football team, a run-first team. And they're eighth in run-pass ratio through week two, so it's not like they aren't running the ball a lot already to begin with. But I'm talking top three in terms of their run-pass ratio. This is going to do a number of things. Number one, what I think the best unit on this team is is this offensive line. Then you add Saquon to it. Then you add... Jalen and what he can do with his legs to it. And then that will help to open up things for AJ and Devontae on the outside and Goddard and, and other people as well, obviously, right? 
So number one is what they're best at. And we'll help Hertz get more comfortable with Kellen Moore, and we're going to talk about Hertz in a second. But it's also going to help protect this defense, keep them off the field, don't expose them like Chip Kelly used to do when he would run up-tempo. They'd go three and out in 20 seconds, and then their defense is gassed back out there on the field again. Right? This team is probably going to need, until they fix their defensive issues, is going to need to turn into a smash mouth, win ugly, grind it out type of games. Because if you try and get into shootouts, I don't think they're a team that's going to win shootouts with their defense currently. Now, as we look to Jalen Hurts' day, we really got the full Jalen Hurts experience, right? So we got a beautiful passing touchdown that was all about touch, timing, location, and anticipation. A really beautiful throw. We got a quarterback sneak touchdown. We got Jalen accounting for 268 total yards with 85 of those yards coming on the ground. We got some really nice throws and decisions. We got some scrambles to get out of trouble, but we also have some plays where he turned down some quick throws to scramble. And sometimes those scrambles turn into bigger plays, which is, again, the Jalen Hurts experience. But we also got the game-ending interception as well. And the interceptions have really become a regular part of Jalen Hurts, the Jalen Hurts experience as of late. Now, let's talk about a couple things. I'll touch on the, the interception right quick. You really can't make that throw. When you go back and look at that play, Brent Covey is running open on a crossing route. And if he catches, you throw that ball and he catches it, Again, it was open. He's probably going to get to about the 35-yard line. You still have a timeout, and you still have time to continue advancing the ball. If they don't get any more yards, that's a 52-yard field goal with one of the most clutch kickers in NFL history. That's what you, ha you can't just... This was very similar to how the Seahawks game ended last year. They had time to continue working the ball down the field, and I'm pretty sure they had timeouts as well in that situation. But Jalen just wanted it all, or some, I don't know what the thought process was, and got over aggressive and threw it down the field, hunting for the big play. When a, a better play was right there in his eyesight for the taking. He has to make that throw. But again, I thought he did a lot of really good stuff to create explosive plays. Right? So he scrambled out of a number of situations where he then created bigger plays down the field. Whether using his legs to pick up a third and 11. Or finding Devontae Smith on a scramble drill or finding Britton Covey on a scrambled drill. He did a really good job with that. But at, the offense stalled at times due to some of the things that Jalen could help on. There was a number of plays, especially in the quick pass game. Like, for instance, the, the, the fourth down situation, the first fourth down of the game to, to where they ran a, a quick speed out to Saquon Barkley. It's a tight throw, yes. But that's, that is open for that play design. You have to throw that. You have to. Not everyone's going to be wide-ass open. Sometimes you just have to pull the trigger, throw it to the spot with touch and with timing and anticipation, right? So that's an example. There's an example this week, an example from last week of Devontae running an option route and is at a tight window, yes, but you, you can throw the, make these throws and throw it in locations that gives your receiver a better chance to protect the ball and keep the sticks moving and have a better chance of the, at making the catch. Right, but he didn't do that last week, and again, he didn't pull the trigger to Devonte again. Scrambles, and then ends up uh, throwing it to Devonte late, and it ends up out of uh, incomplete, and the drive is over. Right, so things like that he has to get better with. If the especially if this offense is going to be Kellen Moore and Nick Sirianni both want to be passing teams, that's just who they are as players or as coaches. Right, And if they're going to be a quick pass offense, these are plays that Jalen has to make. Some of these windows are not going to be big windows. It's going to be tight windows. It's going to be, window, it's going to be throws where you have to throw to certain locations on time, and you have to trust these play designs. You have to trust what you're seeing. I think Jalen's just not trusting some of these throws at the moment. I think that does get better as he gets more comfortable with the system. But I did think he was inaccurate on an out route early to Devontae in the game, and it was a little bit of foreshadowing. So he leaves it inside to Devontae, he kind of has to turn around and twist his body to catch it, and then he takes a big hit. And then later, on the, on the goal line, within the 10-yard line, I believe, very same situation, similar situation, same route. Jalen throws it, leaves it inside. Ball hits Devontae's hands. It's in both of his hands, but Jesse Bates punches it out. To me, sometimes you got to chalk it up and say, hey, the defender made a great play. 
right? Some people are going to say Devontae has to make that catch. That was a great play by the defender, too. It was a perfectly timed punch. But Jalen has to take that out of the equation entirely and just lead Devontae to space, and that's a touchdown. The Eagles end up kicking a field goal, and we see what happens as they end up losing by one point. Right, So these little things that are stalling drives have to get better, especially if this defense is going to be an average defense throughout the year. But again, you get a lot of, you get with Jalen Hurts, you get a game or you get a guy that's going to create explosive plays. Or you're going to get times where the offense stalls and sputters and is a little bit frustrating. Go back and look at the box scores for a lot of those games in 2022, even though we were blowing teams out. A lot of those points came in bunches. A lot of those points came in bunches. So we need to look and see how does Jalen Hurts continue to improve in Kellen Moore's system, and in particular, running the quick game, running the timing, rhythm, passing part of this offense. But lastly, and this is what I think is most important from this game, my biggest takeaway is not the defense, is not the offense, it's the game management. And it's really the Sirianni influence on this organization overall and on this offense overall, right? We can see it in the game plan. We talked about it last week, and it reared its ugly head again this week. Right? I think a lot of people don't really know what Sirianni's doing because they think it's just Kellen Moore's offense. It is, without a doubt, a blend of the Sirianni and Moore offense. So he is having input and in designing this offense. But in input doesn't just... Input in designing the offense doesn't just relate to drawing up the plays. It also results in selecting the plays that you're going to put on your play sheet. So when you go through and look at your first and 10 play calls, what are the plays that Sirianni and Kellen Moore decided were best to attack this defense this week? What about your second and long plays, your second and short, your third down, your red zone plays, right? Sirianni definitely has a hand in all of this. You can see the similarities in this offense from this year to last year already. And I think it's somewhat to be expected, right? I think as the year continues to progress, we're going to continue to see more of Kellen Moore's concepts, more of his influence over the team. But some of that influence of Sirianni plays out into the situational philosophy. So end of game philosophy, third and long philosophy, where last year we got on Brian Johnson for calling an RPO that ends up in a legal ineligible man downfield penalty. Then you call a screen pass, and then you call a draw on third down. Well, guess what the Eagles did in week one? They called a third and eight quarterback draw to set up a shorter fourth down attempt. First series of the game, another third and 10 quarterback draw play, or third and 11, something like that, right? It's the same Sirianni stuff. He did the same stuff again in 2022. We were just winning, so... Nobody really noticed or cared. It's the same stuff, right? So when we get to the end of the game situation and they decide to throw the ball, again, that just comes back to the same Sirianni stuff that we had to deal with, deal with for the past several years. And I'll say this about the decision to throw. I think two things can be true. I think I understand the decision to pass for, especially knowing that the Falcons had loaded the box and did load the box on that play. They had loaded the box the previous two plays. And then they loaded the box again on that play. By load the box, I mean they took a safety out. Everyone is playing the run. So I understand the play call. And it was there to be made. So I, understand, I, th I think two things can be true. That running the ball is the better decision. And that you still need to execute whatever the play call that was called. The play still needs to be made. Saquon Barkley should still catch that ball, and we're not having this conversation. But he didn't. Now, I think the decision to run the ball is what should have been made. And I think when you're looking at it, you got to look at it from a risk management profile. So what is the worst option that could happen? The worst option is obviously a turnover, but I'm assuming they picked a pass play that is a very low percentage chance of an interception. And fumbles are extremely low percentage chance. So I'm, I'm eliminating the, those scenarios. What is the worst thing that can happen? An incompletion. Because then the clock stops. Right? What's the second worst thing that could happen? If you run the ball. And then you get stopped short. 
because then you're stopped short, right? So the first worst thing you can happen, you pass the ball, you get stopped short, clock stops. Second worst thing that could happen, you run the ball, you get stopped short, but the clock keeps running, right? So the Eagles chose an option that probably had a little bit better of a chance of hitting its upside, but its downside is much worse. And then when you look at the fact that the clock would have run from roughly a minute 40 down to a minute left, and you look at the fact that the Falcons scored with 34 seconds left, so it took them over a minute, or right around a minute after uh, the extra point and the kickoff and everything, it gets really frustrating to see that. But the, the decision is compounded by the fact that they decided to kick the field goal instead of going for the fourth down. And again, again I guess that comes back to philosophy. But in my mind, you got to go for that. You go for that, whether that's third down or if you ran the ball, you likely at least get it to second or your fourth and two, two yards to go, right? Especially when you consider the Falcons had loaded the box the two plays prior. And the Eagles got four yards on the first play, and then they got three yards on the second play. They could probably get at least half of that on the next play, and then you give yourself a much better chance. But the, pro- but the thing with kicking the field goal is at that point in time, Atlanta has to be aggressive and go for a touchdown. Whereas if you go for it on fourth down and you don't get it, now Atlanta has to go farther than they would have had to if you kicked the ball off to them, just based on where the Eagles were on the field. But if they have to go down the field, they're more likely to try and play for the field goal. Coaches just get conservative. We just watched our own coach get conservative. The vast majority of coaches aren't Dan Campbell, right? We thought we had one in Nick Sirianni, but he's really a fake Campbell, as it's turned out. Right? So if, if you give these coaches an opportunity to be conservative, the vast majority of them are going to be conservative. And I think that's what the Eagles should have done. And I think they would have had a much better chance of winning the game at that point in time. Now, at the end of the day, the players still have to execute. And they, the defense did not do a good job of doing what they needed to do to get off the field. They let the Falcons march right down the field on them at that point in time. But I, I just get concerned about, you know, I really wanted to give Sirianni another, Sirianni another chance to see if we can fix some of this stuff. And the season's not over, right? You can't just say... I'm going to give him a chance, and then two weeks into the season, it's you're done with it, right? It's a long season. See if they can correct stuff. But I don't know, man. I, I look at some of the stuff that's going on with the offense in terms of just the decision-making, the situational football, and it just doesn't make me too confident, especially when these decisions are huge once you get into the playoffs. So I'm a little concerned for that. Now, to wrap up, There's a lot to be concerned about, right? But it's week two of the season. This is time for corrections to take place. There's a reason the Patriots struggled every year in September. It's because they were figuring out what are they good at? What are they not good at? They're experimenting. They're finding out what plays are going to be core plays. What plays were core plays last year that they need to take out, right? It's a new organization of individuals, right? So let's give this team a chance to uh, address some stuff and grow. We do need to keep an eye on the linebacker situation. I, I very much think this is not sorted right now. I liked some of the stuff I saw from Zach Bond, but like I said in the linebacker preseason preview, I needed to see more. And as I see more, there's a lot of stuff that is concerning. I think Bond in a hybrid role, that's probably what's best for him, where he plays on the edge. Sometimes he plays as an off-ball linebacker. I think there's things he can do to help your team in that regard. But I think he has to clean up some of his issues. I think the defense overall has to get better and their assignments. They're not sound. This looks like the Matt Patricia defense from last year. And if that doesn't correct, get corrected, this team will not win. And then add to that on offense, game management, situational football, I think can be improved a little bit. But I thought there was a lot of stuff to be excited about with offense, particularly from that offensive line particularly from the fact that the Eagles did move the ball well against a defense that is experienced and doesn't give up a bunch of big plays. I think there's things to grow on. But things don't get easier next week as we take on the New Orleans Saints. 
And I think you're going to be surprised with what you see from the Saints team as we get into that preview. But just remember, it's week two. We don't need to make overarching changes to the entire structure of a team just because in week two, they didn't win or they didn't do a good job in certain areas. Correct the things that you need to correct and grow from there and learn. But this is a long season. This is why we call it a climb. There's a lot of steps to get there. And we're not going to be the team that we need to be in week 18 and week two. So let's have some patience. Let's give these guys a chance to fit in to their new roles, to fit in to the new scheme. And hopefully in a few weeks, this is all behind us and the Eagles are rolling teams and we've really found our identity on what we want to become. So remember, like, subscribe, spread the word. And until next time, go Birds.